The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Come, live in the light. Shine with the joy and the love of the Lord. We are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another. reading from Philippians. My brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. One thing that feels so elusive in our culture today is contentment. On the one hand, we're encouraged to be grateful for what we have, and on the other hand, we're cautioned against complacency as to never get too comfortable with what we have. Generally speaking, when people are asked how much money they would need to be happy, the answer is almost always more than I have right now. So let's spend some time together unpacking what we mean by contentment. And let's add another word into the mix of the conversation, simplicity. We'll get to that a little later. I have three scriptures I want to share with you that will set the framework for our time together. The first comes to us from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it. And again, all was vanity and a chasing after the wind. The second scripture is taken from the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 5 through 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And finally, from Luke's gospel, chapter 12, verse 15. And Jesus said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Here's what I want you to do. If you're watching this message with someone and they're sitting next to you, turn and look them in the eye and say this. My life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So let's quit acting like it does. Occasionally on the heels of a natural disaster like a hurricane, flood, tornado, or wildfire, groups will come to town to interview the survivors of these tragedies, and they'll ask one question. When the time came when you knew you had to evacuate your home and you didn't have time to plan on what you wanted to take with you, what did you actually decide to take with you? Now, many of the responses are understandably similar. Someone said a family pet a photo album, a sentimental treasure. But do you know what no one ever says? No one says, my stuff is so important to me that I decided if I had to die, I wanted it to be while I was sitting in the middle of my living room floor, surrounded by all the stuff I've managed to accumulate over the years. No one says that, like ever. And no one would run back into a burning house to save a loved one, but first run beyond that person to get their laptop instead. The survivor said, I wanted to live, so I got the heck out of there. I wanted to live. It's just stuff, after all. Say it with me. My life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So why, knowing the fleeting and temporary nature of all the things of this world, do we not really believe this? Or if we believe it, we don't act like we believe it. Despite the fact that we say we believe Jesus' words, we still somehow find ourselves devoting a great deal of our time, talents, and resources to the acquisition of more and more stuff. 
We say that our lives do not consist in the abundance of our possessions, but we live as though they do. I think on some intuitive level, we really do get what's going on. I really think we can identify the lunacy of thinking that our self-worth is somehow determined by our net worth and the stuff that we own. So that leads me to believe there's something else that explains why we keep getting sucked back into this life-draining vortex and way of living, or rather way of dying. Yes, culture screams at us if we dare search for life in something other than material goods and services, but we can't put all the blame on the culture around us. We are, after all, helping create the culture in which we are a part of. We, therefore, are culpable in this experience. We have bought into the notion that if we possess a certain something, the dream house, the new car, the perfect job, the amazing spouse, then we will finally be happy. Let's call this idea the restless heart syndrome. Maybe you've heard of restless leg syndrome, a condition in which one has twitches and contractions in the legs. Well, restless heart syndrome works much in the same way, but in the heart and soul rather than the legs. Its primary symptom is discontent. We find that we are never satisfied with anything. We are never even satisfied with the idea of not being satisfied with everything. That's how dissatisfied we actually are. How this translates in real life is that even when we get the thing that we say we desire, we scarcely end up taking time to enjoy it before wanting something else bigger, better, faster. We are perennially discontent and it's killing us. We have some of the highest rates in the world for anxiety, stomach, and intestinal disorders in this country. We're being swallowed alive in our discontentment. Now, please don't hear me saying that being discontent is always bad. It's not. At times, it's even a virtue. The problem is that we are content with all the wrong things. We should be discontented with our public and political discourse in the shape that it is today. It's absolutely toxic and divisive. We should be discontented with systemic and institutionalized racism and sexism. We should be discontented with all the mechanisms and ways we've adopted that diminish, degrade, and destroy the world and planet that we are so blessed to be a part of. We should be discontented with human beings when human beings are denied basic human rights. We should be discontented when two-thirds of the world's population live in abject poverty. One of my favorite websites is firstworldproblems.com. I thought I'd share some of the first world problems with you that I discovered on this site. One, I have so much cash in my wallet, my bottom hurts when I have to sit down. First world problem. Two, I have no place to put my leftovers from dinner because I have too much food in my fridge. First world problem. Three, my poodle can't get a haircut today because of the global pandemic. Ugh, so annoyed with stupid global pandemic. First world problem. I have too much chips for my dip, but if I open more dip, then I'll have too much dip for my chips. Definitely first world problem. My oldest son is watching the 70-inch TV. My youngest son is playing PlayStation on the 65-inch TV. And my daughter is watching a Blu-ray on the 60-inch TV. So I am forced to watch my TV show on my iPad Pro. First world problem. Discontentment. Oddly enough, it's not only adults who feel discontent. I don't remember the exact context of the conversation, but it wasn't too long ago that one of my children said something along the lines of, Gosh, Dad, such and such as mom, let Amber do this or that thing. If only I had Amber's parents, then I'd really be happy. Amber's dad is really nice. He's not mean like you're mean. Discontentment. Discontent with the house we live in, the car we drive, the job we get paid to do, or the spouse we chose to marry. Remember, remember your wedding day? The honeymoon? The promise that no matter what, life would be full of romantic rose petal trails and gourmet candlelit meals on the table every night, even after you'd worked a 12-hour shift. You'd never pass gas in the company of one another or poop with the door open. You'd set your alarm clock early in the morning just before your spouses went off so you could get up and brush your teeth before that first kiss of the day. After all, we know that morning breath is a leading cause of divorce. And then when you have kids, you will always be the one who gets up in the middle of the night to do the feeding, even when it's not your turn. You're dreamy. How did your spouse get so lucky to find out, find you out of 7 billion people? 
on the planet. But then something along the way happened. The honeymoon ends. Life gets hard fast. Life is hard always. And you realize just how much energy and effort actually goes into making a relationship work and a love to have staying power. In the meantime, you bump into that old friend from high school. She makes you feel goosebumps and you can't remember the last time you felt goosebumps. She makes you feel special and understood and appreciated and not taken for granted. I mean, who doesn't want to feel special and understood and appreciated and not taken for granted? And if you are convinced that you are not happy where you are at with who you are with, then you might even reason that you deserve to be these things with this person. And of course, it doesn't take much to run into that person on the street or a class reunion or on Facebook who runs a very good chance of, by your estimate, making you happy where your current partner isn't. This other person can make you complete, make you whole, or so you reason, make you content. And who doesn't want to be content? Contentment. It's all the rage. Everyone desires it. So why does it seem so elusive? How does one actually cultivate contentment? How do we find contentment in the things we should find contentment in and be discontent with the things we should be discontent with? Well, the Apostle Paul is an excellent example of how to cultivate contentment. In his letter to the Philippians, he wrote of the secret, as he called it, of his contentment. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Paul writes, For I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, if there was ever a person who deserved to be discontent, it was Paul. After all, this guy did not live an easy life. I'm not usually one to hand out lists during sermons because it sometimes feels a little overly simplistic and doesn't always take into account the complexity of the lives that we really live on a day-to-day -day basis rather than the ones that authors uh, like to think we live. But I want to offer this list of four keys to cultivating contentment that I found very helpful uh, from a Methodist colleague of mine by the name of Adam Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton writes, uh, one, the first key to cultivating contentment begins with remembering these four words. It could be worse. If you ever find yourself discontented with something or someone, just remember, say it with me, it could be worse. No matter how bad things get, remember, you can always, always make them worse. You're driving your eight-year-old car. Only one of the windows will roll down. The check engine light won't go off. The air no longer works. You can only open the passenger door from the outside or simply crawl through the window like they did on the Dukes of Hazard. Your car is in the shop more than on the road. Owning your car, in fact, is now more of a mechanical hobby than a means of transportation. But say it with me. It could be worse. You just closed on that 100-year-old house. It has so much charm and character. You're so excited. Everyone agrees you got the house of your dreams for a steal. But the first night you're in the house, a storm rolls in, and you are wakened by a slow drip, drip, drip of water that hits you smack dab in the middle of the head. Three estimates later and the realization that the home inspector that you hired was not very thorough and you were on the hook for a brand new roof. And then there's the dry rot problem. And then there's the termites, what they've done to your house too. It's going to cost you thousands of dollars to get this house to where it really needs to be. Say it with me. It could be worse. Tonight you sit down for dinner across from your spouse and say it with me. It could be worse. Okay, don't actually say that part out loud. Best to keep that one to yourself. Number two, the second key to cultivating contentment. Ask yourself this one question. For how long will this thing make me happy? So often we buy something thinking that it will make us happy, only to find that the happiness lasts about as long as it takes to open the box. If you're thinking about buying a new car, why not first call up a rental car place to see if they have the exact same model? Pay the $46.95, take it out for the day, then make a decision. 
Otherwise, you might be on the hook for a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar car you could have learned you didn't like just for forty six dollars and ninety five cents. Three, the third key for for cultivating contentment is developing a grateful heart. Gratitude is essential if we are to be content. We can either complain or we can be grateful. I can focus on the things I don't like, or I can focus on the things that I do. There was a husband who stormed out the door late one night. He'd had it. His wife was driving him crazy. He ranted and raved for at least a good mile about all the stuff that his wife does that annoys him. But then, by the end of the second mile driving down that road, a thought, an emotion, a realization came over this man that although his wife does some things that drive him mad, she is actually a gift to him from God. And he's not ready to ask God for a gift receipt. And he's certain that he does a ton of stuff that drives her absolutely bonkers. He thinks about the way his wife's face lights up when she smiles. He thinks about the way she tucks their children in at night. He thinks about the way that she goes to work and then comes home and works to the bone for another four or five hours and how she holds it all together. He thinks about the way he feels when she kisses him goodbye in the morning. Pretty soon the man is back home again and what seemed all-consuming is now not so all-consuming any longer. Sometimes the feelings of love follow doing things that are loving. Emotions generally follow our actions and typically not the other way around. Four, the fourth key to cultivating contentment comes from answering one question. Where does your soul find satisfaction? The world says you'll find it at the shopping mall, but scripture says you'll find it in God. All the polls and surveys out there keep telling us the same thing when it comes to what people need, community, spiritual moorings, and the chance to make a difference in the world. St. Augustine said that human beings are restless until they find their rest in God. Jesus said the key to the soul finding satisfaction is in loving God with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength, and neighbor as self. I want to switch gears for a second to close out our time together today by saying a few words about simplicity. I know of no path toward contentment that does not travel through the land of simplicity. Simplicity is simply the idea that less is more. It's probably no surprise to anyone that we don't need so much clutter in our lives and that in fact, all the stuff and clutter actually just works to stress us out beyond belief. The problem, however, is that even though we know this to be true, it's still so incredibly difficult to get it out of the, get ourselves out of this consumer loop of madness. We consume more than we need. One definition of cancer is having something that consumes more resources than it needs in our body. We are living cancerous lifestyles that simply are not sustainable. Every year we consume more and more non-renewable resources. We're even passing those points of no return on the rate of renewable resources in the world. The U.S. comprises just 5% of the world's population, but we produce 40% of the world's waste. And so in order to keep up with the, the demand uh, in the United States for something just like paper products, 1.4 billion trees have to be cut down each year. Each person in the United States uses two pine trees worth of paper every single year. The United States goes through 2.5 million plastic bottles every hour, and only one of those four is recycled, and that one usually has water still remaining in, in it. There are enough plastic bottles that are thrown away each year that if we were to line them up side by side, they would circle the earth four times over. Why not carry a reusable water bottle? The water is free, it tastes great, and there's nothing, nothing to throw away. Recycling one glass bottle saves enough electricity to power a computer for 30 minutes. As it turns out, we are not powerless. We can live more with less. Let us pray. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning we come round right. Amen.
confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for bishops, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated, Restore valleys, mountains, and pastures, and still and running waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill, especially those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caretakers who see to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us how you clothe all in your mercy. We pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and other personal care assistance in this community. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our privilege and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, 
through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the fruits of God for the people of God. Come to the table, all are welcome. For the gifts of God are free. Amen.
Let us pray. O God, our life, our strength, our food, we give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.